I'm J.P. Westland, the president of the Humanist Association of Ottawa. I'm thrilled to be here tonight on uh, World Fr Press Freedom Day, and uh, I think this is a very timely uh, topic of discussion, and we'll have a really interesting discussion tonight, and uh, have some time for questions at the end as well. So we're just waiting on uh, Dr. DiCarlo. Okay. Well, I think we can get uh, we can get started with introductions. Um, I'm going to um, introduce the panelists briefly. Uh, starting uh, starting to your left, Henry Beasel. A distinguished Emeritus Professor of English at Concordia University in Montreal, where he taught for 30 years and founded a flourishing program. Henry is an Ottawa poet, playwright, fiction writer, translator, and editor with over 30 books published. As a playwright, he came to international fame with Inuk and the Sun, premiered at the Stratford Festival in 1982, and since then translated into many languages. Henry Bissell is an indefatigable defender of academic freedom, freedom of the press, and freedom of expression. So let's thank Henry for joining us. Tonight. <laughs> Next to the right, uh, we have Miss Shepherd. I don't have much for you, uh, Miss Shepherd, tonight. Uh, we'll make it very short here. Um, but Lindsay Shepard is uh, president and co-founder of the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry, um, and uh, we're very happy to have her join us here tonight. <laughs> Next to the right, Dr. Rick Maida is associate professor of psychology at Acadia University, Wolfville, Nova Scotia. A small town university in Atlantic Canada has been thrust into the epicenter of a national debate about free speech on campus amid new allegations a controversial professor has made racist and transphobic comments in class. Critics and supporters of, of Associate Professor Rick Maida have come forward after Acadia University in Nova Scotia launched an investigation following complaints from students, faculty, and others about his polarizing views. A group of Canadian professors dedicated to the defense of academic freedom have condemned the Acadia probe, while Maida's designated department head says some students at the Wolfville School say they have stopped attending his class because of his comments. Professor Maida is an articulate proponent of freedom of expression. And last but not least, Dr. Christopher DiCarlo is a past visiting research scholar at Harvard University in the Faculty of Arts and Scientists, Sciences, Department of Anthropology, and the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and <coughs> Ethnology. Here he conducted research for two major papers entitled The Comparative Brain, The Evolution of Human Reasoning, and The Evolution of Religion, Why Many Need to Believe in Deities, Demons, and the Unseen. In April 2008, he was awarded TV Ontario's Big Ideas Best Lecturer in Ontario Award. He is currently engaged in writing Flying Without a Pilot, a determined look at the future of ethics, law, and the value of human behavior. His book entitled How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass, A Critical Thinker's Guide to Asking the Right Questions, has gone into its fifth printing. Dr. DiCarlo's latest book is Sec Six Steps to Better Thinking. Let's welcome Dr. So I'm going to hand the mic over because we're a little short on mics tonight over to the panelists. What we're going to do is start uh, with uh, if the panelists have prepared some opening statements about their experiences with freedom of expression, uh, uh, with the climate in Canada and some of the things that they've experienced. I'd like to start, uh, if it's okay, with uh, Dr. DiCarlo and work to the left. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to be here. There was uh, quite an accident on the 401 that kept us detained, but we, we managed to get here nonetheless. I'm going to tell you a bit about my experience uh, in academia and some of the, uh, the things that have happened uh, to me. Um, 
in academia in Canada and elsewhere, freedom of expression, I've found, is, is not so free. And I can attest the, to this personally and anecdotally, but I'm sure I, I'm not the only one. Um, while on contract as an instructor at a university, we'll call it University One, um, in southern Ontario, I was shortlisted and interviewed for no less than five tenure track positions. Uh, never hired for any of these. People on each of the hiring committees, the committees did not care for the type of philosophy I was doing, which was interdisciplinary with the evolutionary sciences. Nor did they care with whom I had been associated. People like Michael Roos, the fact that I was uh, a postdoc at Harvard and I'd worked with a gentleman named Edward O. Wilson. Uh, the last straw came when an interdisciplinary position was announced uh, within uh, psychology and philosophy, but this was created to hire, hire the spouse of another professor who was being hired in another department. So a colleague of mine informed me of this particular type of nepotistic hiring, but it didn't stop me from confronting the dean. Uh, dean did not like being called out on this, and this led to the eventual decrease of my breathing privileges as an academic that particular school. Quickly the courses for which I had seniority were given to the new hires and there was nothing my union could do. Students set up two protest booths in the arts building and the central students building to save my job. They attained over a thousand signatures and conducted a sit-in in the president's office. He agreed to uh, meet with me, gave me some lip service about hiring practices and that was it for me. At University Two, in southern Ontario. I was teaching a critical thinking course. I wrote the words, uh, we're all African on the board in 2005 and maintained that if evolutionary theory is correct, then it follows that every one of us evolved from a common ancestor somewhere in central uh, eastern Africa. A student called me out on this, an Aboriginal student, and said, um, my people wouldn't accept that. And I said, I agree. Um, I know a fair bit about Indian mythology, and I can understand why they wouldn't agree with that particular uh, knowledge claim. But when she said, who's right? I said, not your people, because they're not. <laughs> and so as a professor, it was my obligation to teach the facts as best that, that I gain them and, and in the most responsible manner possible. And I said, but you know what? Why don't you bring in some elders? I'll bring in some of my faculty uh, colleagues from the sciences. We'll get together and we'll have a, a discussion about what can be done when culture you know, conflicts or clashes with scientific reasoning and scientific facts. The class erupted with applause. They thought this is the exact reason why you're at university. Um, the subtitle of my latest book is actually called how to disagree and get along. And I found this is sorely lacking in academia. A lot of people take offense to, to having their feelings hurt. Uh, this didn't go over too well. The student and two other uh, fundamentalist Christian students complained to the dean. I received a registered letter saying, knock it off, this is going into your official file. I had to be shortlisted and interviewed for a tenure track position there. The position suddenly went away. That was it. I joined with the union, we sued, we won, but I was still out of a job. At University 3, after this, in southern Ontario, uh, the promise of tenure for a six-year period, three different, uh, two different three-year uh, hiring cycles. Uh, never hired, uh, eventually given a lot of reasons, but it just basically came down to the fact that as an outed atheist, as a known uh, person uh, who champions freedom of expression and, and fairness, it, it didn't work out. And so it went to the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. We sued for discrimination of creed, where my creed is atheism, I think it was the first case in the history of North America. And, you know, there was a settlement, but again, out of another job. Um, now, folks, when you sue three universities, the word gets around. <laughs> and so it is not surprising that I am you know, here today without tenure. Um, believe it or not, there have been other examples of lost opportunities since those. So those are the three that I can mention. I've been blacklisted. I've been labeled um, 
you know, a boat rock or a pain in the ass, a gadfly, which is incredibly ironic considering what Socrates was, you know. Um, there was a, a, a slide I was going to show you if there was time. It was a, a fake tweet by Donald Trump, and it was Socrates corrupting the youth of Athens. Sad. <laughs> so, the effects of this is basically without tenure, and it's highly likely I'll never get tenure. My life, the lives of my family, the lives of so many potential students have been severely affected because of unfair discrimination against me for being an advocate for free speech. Several tenured colleagues of mine have informed me in no uncertain terms that my reputation will always precede me in every application for a university or college position. Knowing who I am and what I stand for, once administrators do a Google search on me, my free thought affiliations and stance become immediately apparent, the red flags go up, and my CV is committed to the flames. The follow from all this is due to my passion for critical thinking and freedom of expression, I've been denied a life in academia, the chance to teach, research, publish, mentor, and contribute to the bodies of knowledge within my field. I've also been denied untold numbers of opportunities that result from being a respected university professor. In all likelihood, my family and I will never financially recover from these actions. I will never receive tenure. I will never hope to be granted emeritus status after I retire. Instead, I am barely a sessional instructor at University of Toronto. And I mean barely because, yes, guess what's happening all over again. You might be thinking what I have thought and my wife has thought on many occasions. Maybe I should get out of academia altogether. But the question is, should I have to for being an advocate for free speech? And uh, my son Jeremy and Lindsay and I were talking on the way here. And one of the things that has hurt my career more than anything else is trying to be fair. When you try to be fair, I have found, at least in academia, you end up angering both sides. You're stuck in the middle and you have no real human affiliation other than trying to be the fair person, trying to see different sides, different angles, and, and, and being an advocate for free speech. As a professor with more than just a few teaching awards under my belt, I take great care and pride in researching and teaching information in an epistemically responsible way. Why then have I been continue to be harassed, abused, and fired for providing students with responsibly attained and thought-provoking information simply because it has not conformed to someone's particular ideology. On university and college campuses, diversity and inclusion is a joke. This is not academia, as I experienced it when I was an undergrad. This is ideological oppression and rampant nepotism. If Plato were alive today, he would be in tears of what an absurd and sorry state his academy has become. Since the early 90s, I have watched departments in the arts, humanities, and social sciences hire friends and acquaintances who share collective political ideologies, which have severely limited any faculty who might possibly share dissenting opinions or beliefs. The marketplace of ideas in academia has become a flea market of like-minded, fragile ideologies incapable of withstanding even the slightest critique of critical thinking. In closing commentary on some of my personal experiences involving the suppression of free thought in academia, I wish to remind anyone within earshot that, as, George, as, as Orwell stated, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Thank you. Um, I didn't get a chance to actually prepare uh, remarks because I've been spending the day trying to figure out how to uh, respond to uh, emails from the uh, dean on a because I've been uh, invited, uh, in a more yeah, lack of a better word, to, uh, to a meeting to discuss uh, discipline. So I've been having a lot kind of going on in the background. Uh, so I, uh, so since I didn't get a chance to prepare any remarks, I thought the best thing I'd do is uh, try to tell my story in chronological order because most of what's happened to me has been over the uh, past year. So at a year ago at this time, um, overall life was uh, quite good for me. I was a tenured associate professor at Acadia University. I really uh, loved uh, my job, especially the teaching aspect. And um, yeah, last year at this time I'd won two teaching awards. Um, you know, the evaluations were quite good. Um, you know, life was, you know, life was 
like, yeah, like just could have been better, at least on the professional front. Uh, but I was bothered by what was happening um, beneath the surface. Uh, so just noticing in the background that there were incidents happening. It seems to start in 2015 with um, the Christakis's in Ye at Yale with the, um, you know, with the uh, the controversy that ensued just over her Erica Christakis's comment about the Halloween costumes, and from there the incident just seemed to be increasing with frequency, and it bothered me that there was the case of Jordan Peterson happening in the background, but here I am in a psychology department and no one at the lunchroom was even talking about that. And so there was that sense of things just do not seem to be adding up and I couldn't seem to figure out why. Uh, so a year about this time, I'd organized a panel discussion on free speech. And uh, while the event itself uh, went well, it was quite interesting watching the second hour with all of the uh, dis uh, questions that were asked, which turned out not really to be questions, but more of these long-winded rants. And it didn't seem to really make sense. Uh, over the summer, I was disturbed by what the, the incident at uh, Evergreen State College, with what had happened to Brett Weinstein, and uh, the cancellation of the free speech panel that was supposed to happen at Ryerson. Uh, so for that reason, I thought, well, I don't want this to happen at Acadia, and so I gave uh, a comprehensive talk on free speech at the end of September. And so that one, I really went out of my way to ensure that it would have the academic rigor. So I think I had some like 20 pages of references that I circulated, and I think it would have been even longer had that been in an MLA or APA format, hoping uh, that would simulate discussion. Uh, but all I got was opposition. There was no discussion to be had. Um, so really, um, where I think, so I was, yes, yeah, so basically I was trying to, uh, between September and November, I was speaking out more what was happening behind the scenes with contract negotiations with the, between our union and the administration. Uh, so that was where I was first started speaking out and going on to Facebook since I wasn't having much uh, luck speaking out, uh, just using uh, emails up in the, in the, you know, trying to institute chain from within. Uh, so that was when I first started trying to become outspoken using Facebook. And I guess the next major incident that really inspired me then to join Twitter actually was uh, Lindsay's uh, story. So just knowing how she, you know, what she'd gone through and how she handled it and when she joined Twitter, then I thought, okay, maybe I'll join Twitter too as a way to connect and uh, get support. And that turned out to actually be a godsend, because uh, in late November, early December, uh, the dean had asked me to, he had recommended that I take down a post I made on Facebook in which I critiqued um, a master's thesis that had won an award, and the title of it was an autoethnography of how a student had come to um, terms with his sexual identity through interpretive dance, which as a topic would have been fine, but it was basically when we refer to autoethnography, it's basically like a diary. You know, when you read the thesis, all it does is say, these are my beliefs and I'll use research now to confirm my own beliefs. So it basically read like a diary and couldn't extend it beyond you know, just the individual in question. So that was an academic critique. Uh, but I was asked to take it, or it was recommended I take it down because it could be construed as homophobia. And so um, that was, I guess, the first time where I was, um, I guess there was, which I, an event that I saw as a threat to my academic freedom. And so then in December, I uh, released a critique of an article that was in the student newspaper, which was about uh, gender hire, you know, uh, gender discrimination, saying it wasn't actually discrimination that could play a role for uh, disparities, but various um, other factors, uh, which I then continued in January in my course, my introductory psychology class. Um, and the, I guess where I got into the spotlight was a tweet that I made to Andrew Shear. So the other event that had happened in the university was I uh, had expressed concern about the decolonization efforts that were happening, one of my main concerns being that it would actually lead to an increase in racial, racial tension. Uh, so that had played a role in the tweet, and at that point then, once that became in the media spotlight, I had a feeling that things were not going to be uh, going well at that point. So uh, I continued to speak out. The major event that I spoke out in February uh, was I played a, um, a clip by Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia, and it was from the Independent Women's Forum. And after I showed a clip uh, from that segment where they just talked about workplace harassment, uh, a student, of course, had equated that with me endorsing her rapist. So that happened on uh, the previous, yeah, I think Friday the 9th. Uh, yes, basically, yeah, so that happened early February. And right around that time, there was uh, an email sent from the Women and Gender Studies Coordinator saying that uh, it's okay to have academic freedom, but it can't be a threat 
uh, you know, you can't create, create a threatening climate for uh, women, you know, uh, female academic researchers. And so shortly after that incident, that's when I got uh, noticed that I was being investigated for uh, my, you know, my commentary on pretty much all different forms. You can read the letter. It's very, very broad in terms of the, um, the space that it covers. Uh, so in the meantime, then, I was also dealing with the designated head who had made um, these assertions that I was being homophobic and racist in class, uh, amongst other very serious allegations. And so that's been something I've been fighting in the background. And so at this stage, I've been, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, um, I've been asked to you know, meet for disciplinary procedures. And so that's what's happened at the level of, I guess, the VP academic and the dean. And with the department, what I forgot to add is that um, as a result of my comments, uh, shortly afterwards, what I noticed was that uh, the courses that I've been teaching for years, so like with the introductory psychology, which I've taught the first half since 2006, uh, that's now going to be taught by a new hire who's never been, brought, we don't even know who that person is yet, and it's a large class on campus, and that's on the books with no instructor. Um, so uh, I think that speaks in terms of the, you know, uh, the courses that were uh, taken away from me. Uh, what I found interesting, though, was an article on the Aboriginal People's Television Network um, uh, website. Uh, so shortly before I decided to go public at the end of February to make this, um, yeah, something that I wanted to be in the public spotlight, uh, was uh, a quotation in the actual article where the media spokesman had said that, um, that the university was going to do what it can to accommodate students who did not want to take my courses. That's because I was teaching the mandatory courses, like the large section of introductory psychology, uh, the research methods. Uh, so there was quite blatant uh, that the media spokesman was actually willing to say that. And um, yeah, so that's basically where it stands now, which is where I'm in that situation of the uncertainty, where um, yeah, the dean wants to meet with me, and I've been arguing that I would like to have a lawyer present. And his response was, well, you can have a lawyer, but we don't need it for this occasion. And so I'm trying to actually just fight for legal representation to be present at the meeting. So that's where things stand and at this current time. I mean, just on the theme of, um, I guess, like these lawsuits that are going on and stuff, I also got an interesting email today. A fellow grad student is claiming that I'm using my Twitter to um, encourage discrimination against him. So that's kind of interesting. We'll see how that goes. That's a formal complaint. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be a very nice weekend. Um, all right. So basically, my story is, you know, back in November, I played a clip from TVO's The Agenda featuring Jordan Peterson in my class. Uh, I was disciplined because I was told that the topic of that episode, um, gender neutral pronouns, were not up for debate. Um, so I secretly recorded that, that meeting, released it to the media, and here I am, okay. Um, but instead of just, you know, kind of whining about uh, the state of free speech at universities or, you know, the state of open inquiry, I decided I should actually maybe try to do something about it. Um, so I started the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry um, with some fellow grad and undergrad students from uh, both Wilfrid Laurier University and University of Waterloo. And we are not an official student club. We don't get any university money. We don't get any university resources. It's for a simple bureaucratic reason that grad students and undergrad students cannot be on the same clubs. Um, so it's not like we were denied, you know, there's no story. There is stories about like free speech clubs being denied status and stuff like that within universities, but it's not like that for us. It's just a very simple uh, barrier. Um, but we've quickly found out just from being um, a club since January that trying to host events on a campus is extremely difficult. Um, so most recently, uh, I'll, I'll start back in March. So. But first of all, let me dispel a common claim. So when you start a free speech club, a lot of people think it's like an alt-right club um, or your alt-right apologists, and it's just simply not true. I mean, we hosted um, a libertarian guy who was you know, advocating for pro-open borders. Um, we've had just a pub night where people talk about anything. But of course, critics gloss over those things, and they go straight to events like the one we wanted to host with Faith Goldie, who's a former Rebel Media personality. She got fired for being on the Daily Stormer. 
Um, and so we wanted to host her. We wanted to host a debate back in March. No one would debate her. Okay, so we figured we'll, we'll still have her come in. And then we'll have a very vigorous Q&A session, open floor. Uh, this was a free event. And, you know, let's just have her ideas out there and then let's uh, put them up to the test. Let's challenge them, right? Uh, but no, while uh, before she had even began speaking, someone pulled the fire alarm. Um, and the thing is, these protesters, they also had, you know, a very fun looking counter protest outside on the quad. You know, they had like music, they had a they had an artist uh, singing for them, but that wasn't enough for them. They also had to shut down ours, um, so that was over. But we thought, uh, let's bring her back, okay? And this was a debate among even our club executives because we realized that if, when you invite someone who, you know, let's, I, my, my understanding is she's a white nationalist. Okay, when you invite someone like that, people see it as an endorsement, which it's not. Um, but we decided, okay, yes, the optics might be hard to deal with, but let's do it because otherwise it's a victory for people who pull fire alarms. Something which happened, by the way, here um, with Janice Fiamengo's talk, I think, is it in March sometime? Yeah. 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 So um, <coughs> we decided let's try again. Laurier um, was kind of stalling. They made up this 15 day health and safety review process. Uh, they kind of were slow to respond to emails. Uh, eventually, these 15 days ran out, even though we had requested the room over a month in advance. And so we thought, okay, let's look 10 minutes down the street to University of Waterloo. One of our executives is from University of Waterloo. Let's see if they'll do it. Okay, they agreed. Uh, 1500 for a room booking, 1500 for security. We can do that. So then I, I go and meet with them. It was a room similar to this. Um, and then they inform me that you know, $1,500 for security was probably not accurate because they received word that the Antifa, you know, against fascism groups are planning protests. Um, so they, they said they'll get a figure to me by the end of the day or whatever. Okay, the figure turned out to be $28,500. <laughs> um, and this is just for uh, a talk. This one was actually Faith Goldie and um, Dr. Ricardo Duchenne, who's a professor at University of New Brunswick, wrote a book called Canada in Decay. It's about um, this term ethnocide um, and mass immigration. So they were going to be in conversation. Uh, that would cost $28,500 to, to uh, watch, have a talk like that being hosted. Uh, so we, I mean, we had to cancel it, right? We, we can't afford that. Um, and then that brings us up to today. I'm hoping on May 9th, the evening of May 9th, to be hosting Francis Widowson who's a professor, an associate professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. Um, and so Laurier was kind of, they seem to be kind of going back and forth on this, but at, uh, I think it was, yeah, yesterday, at 4.32 p.m. they announced a policy change where uh, student groups will be required to pay for all extra security fees for a speaker. And then at 4.45 p.m., they told us bringing in Francis Widowson will cost us $5,473. So it might not seem like a lot compared to the $28,500, but let's just take a step back. I mean, this is a professor at a Canadian university who wants to speak on the campus of another Canadian university. Should that really cost $5,743? Or sorry, $5,473? Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's kind of something to, to grapple with because maybe there is some legitimacy to, you know, paying some security fees, I would be okay with that. Um, but at the same time, let's realize it's it's really only one side of the political cultural spectrum that engages in these deplatforming tactics. Um, you could call it the left, maybe that's a bit simplistic, but um, they, they are the ones who you know platform and, and see it as their duty to shut down hate speech. You know, free speech is hate speech, no platform for hate, no Nazis in this town. You know, these are the kind of slogans they use. So they're referring to Francis Widowson also as uh, a white supremacist. I think the protest they're planning for May 9th, which I've seen, is called um, Racists Are Not Welcome Here. Um, and so, yes, this is, is what we have to deal with. Um, it's sad, but uh, we'll, hopefully it's going to happen. I'm actually going to be starting a GoFundMe tonight for that $5,473 because we don't have that either. <laughs>
Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for asking me. Sometimes, occasionally, it's good to be the senior. I am the senior of this crowd, and uh, that had its advantages, I've come to realize, because my university career ended before all this political stuff happened. I just got it at the very end. I remember I retired in 1995, and I remember just a year before, some young, some young student saying to me uh, in the class, Professor Beisel, by the way, the name is Beisel, think by and sell. Okay. Uh, Professor Beisel, I don't feel comfortable in your class. I looked at her and said, well, bring a pillow next time. <laughs> <laughs> After I had, the class had recovered from the laugh, I got the same response. I said, it's my job to make you feel uncomfortable. It's, it's my job as a university teacher to challenge everything that you now think you know because you don't, and you, so that's, that was 19, 19, 1994. So I was lucky, uh, Chris, I was 20 years a full professor out of my 30 years, and uh, I did have tenure, uh, although I was always considered, and I have that in common with you, Chris, I was named in 1963 in Edmonton, Alberta, the university's dead fly. And I'm quite proud and I continue to try to find ways to upset my audience so that they will revisit whatever it is they think they know. I'm very much uh, a Socra so uh, Socra follower of Socrates because I do believe we all end will end up realizing, knowing that we know nothing. I had nevertheless, despite the fact that the universities were more tolerant at that time, I had my own problems because I was always looking for the Achilles heel of this institution where I was. I taught at the recommendation of my chairman in Toronto at the University of Munich for two years. And when the chairman of the English department at a meeting looked around and invited our foreign guest, Henry Meisel, whether he had any uh, insights about the department, uh, I replied, I said, well, I wonder, Professor Clayman, why is the English department in Munich run like a medieval Spanish court? <laughs> <laughs> My contract was not renewed. <laughs> uh, when I was in Trinidad, you know, uh, the Canadian government sent me as a Canadian aid professor to Trinidad, the University of the West Indies, which was then in the process of establishing a uh, arts and science department. The university was largely engineering and biology. And uh, I there gave a talk, which I entitled Faith, Forgery, and Fallacy. Um, the result was remarkable. I turned to the, the early in the morning. It was, it was uh, published in the, at least the report was published in the uh, Port of Spain newspaper. And my phone rang at 8 o'clock in the morning the Canadian High Commissioner on the line, oh, Professor Beisel, I wonder if you would care to drop over to the office for a chat. I said, is there anything to talk about, High Commissioner? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I went there, and I was told in no uncertain terms things like faith, for forgery, and fallacy, an attack on the established religion. And I had reasons for that, but I won't, I won't uh, uh, bore you with all the anecdotes. Uh, he kept on saying to me, Professor Bison, you understand, we are here to embody the Canadian image. By the time he said that the third time, I said to him, uh, Mr. High Commissioner, if you repeat this, I'm going to vomit on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> because we are here to protect the interests of the Bank of Commerce. Let's be honest about it. So that, I, that contract wasn't for you to <laughs> I then went to the University of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, there I quickly discovered that uh, things were not all what they appeared to be. The Social Credit Party, a distinctly right-wing party, 
headed by Ernest Manning, had been running the country, the, 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 the province for I don't know how many years. Not Manning, he wasn't that old, but uh, I think since the 30s. So I went after them. I started a magazine for the express purpose not only of providing an opportunity for writers to find at that time in Canada, we were just discovering that we had a literature, uh, but also to attack the government. Well, I was quickly uh, labeled. They even made inquiries about whether I had any Nazi uh, background or activities. I found out. They put me in jail. My life was threatened. Uh, my life, my, I had a very kind of, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't very savvy about these things. It got me in 1963. I got a call from my physician who said, Oh, a colleague of mine wants to come and talk to you. I had unlisted my number, my telephone number, because I was, we were constantly talked, uh, called and threatened that my children or my child would be, would be killed and so forth. So I unlisted the number. And can I give him your number, this, this colleague of mine? Uh, he wants to talk to you. Well, he came to talk to me. I said, go ahead. I have suspected nothing. Well, he actually came to offer me an alternative between uh, taking a bribe and laying off Ernest Manning, who had come to really detest me, it seems, uh, or uh, chairing the face of Socrates. Well, of course, I preferred the, face, the fate of Socrates, but that contract wasn't renewed either for two years, and that's how I finally ended up in Montreal. And I said to the chairman at the time, I said, Neil, I have rocked every boat I've ever been in. I warn you. I said, that's all right, that's what we want. Well, when I was rocking the boat, I'm not so sure that he really wanted that, but that's another story. Anyway, I wanted to let you know that I do know what's going on in academia now. In the late 80s, early 90s, the politicization of the university began. And it began you couldn't say certain things. Uh, and many people trying to accommodate the desires of the dean and all the administrators would play along. But I don't, I, you can't play along with that. Political correctness is a form of fascism, and you have to oppose it at every step. The people always say, oh, well, then, you know, then all the, all the right-wing crazies say, they say, I have a right to say that, yes, you have a right to say it in public, and expose yourself to other people who will question you. Not to do that is like slamming the door on the house that's on fire. Be sure what will happen. Anyway, I decided that my main contribution might be to say something more. Uh, fundamental about the nature of language. Uh, and I gave a speech not long ago. Oh, sorry, I, I should hold this to my mouth. <laughs> if anybody can't hear me, please uh, immediately leap up as I would and say, Hey, I can't hear you louder. <laughs> I'll try my best to keep this in front of my mouth. It would be hard to read this. I think I'll have to use glasses. <laughs> reminds me. Yeah. Three minutes, yes. Okay. Have I gone on too long? I can stop. I want to. I just want to read you a passage from that speech that I gave in June at a humanist convention in Toronto, uh, in which I talked about the relationship between uh, art, specifically poetry, what I am, poet, playwright. And science. I'm also my wife Arlette, who's sitting at the back uh, watching me. She always says I'm a scientist monkey. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm not only a scientist monkey. I'm simply a monkey. <laughs> Here is what I would like to uh, share with you, and I will get uh, JB to cut me up when it's too long. <laughs> I uh, talked about poetry and language because poets are, after all, traditionally, and I think to this day, the guardians of the language. 
kind of quote you now, uh, handled by people who are not that in this language is another story. I'm not sure for you. What in the whole makes you laugh you. or cry are words carrying and juggling meanings, alluding to hidden connections and contradictions, triggering associations and conjuring images, words arranged in rhythmic patterns that resonate with memories and emotions. It all starts with words. That is why Shelley called poets the authors of language. Poets are utterly dependent on finding and using the right word. Les mots juste is their commitment and obsession. Their laboratory is life itself, where they search for the word or phrase that most truthfully captures and communicates the complexity of experience. They do so with the same assiduous exactitude with which scientists labor to bring their theories into accord with observation. Poets are the supreme custodians and keepers of language, and since language is what makes us human, poets are the guardians of our humanity. Our fellow creatures on this planet have ways of communicating too, but their grunts, growls, and whistles have never crossed the watershed between their concern with food, fear, and fornication, and our search for understanding and meaning in the world we inhabit. In the process, humans have reached a level of communication that is providing us with knowledge and insight into the universe that is nothing short of miraculous. Remember that we are essentially walking bags filled with 10 gallons of water in which a handful of chemicals are dissolved. And here we go telling each other how everything was born from nothing 13.7 billion years ago, how one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second later, our universe was the size of an infinitesimal dot that began to inflate faster than the speed of light, and so on and so forth. These mind-blowing insights into the origins of the universe, of our planet, and the evolution of life uh, are the direct result of our acquiring language, and with it the ability to abstract, question, search, and think. Language is the measure of our humanity. As nations and as individuals, we are as rich or poor, true or false, base or honorable as our language. In their care and nurture of language, poets carry out the fundamental mission of words, which is to name the thing, an event, an idea, an idea precisely without the equivocation for what it is. The mission is the foundation of civilization, and its success depends on the honesty and truthfulness which with speaker and writer use language to communicate with us. The health, happiness, and evolution of scientists, society depends on it. And part of that is, of course, the freedom to use the language that is most apt and correct. So you would expect humanity to be totally committed to the authentic use of language. The reality is that there has probably never been a time when language was as systematically abused, degraded, and perverted as it is today. More energy, skill, and money are employed in using words to deceive and manipulate than in their honest use. In politics, advertising, insurance, the media, religion, and the legal profession, to name but the most notorious, whole armies of people derive their livelihood from abusing words to mislead, misrepresent, misinform, distort, and lie. Maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask a few questions just to get some discussion started uh, between the panelists. It's just going to be open and uh, you can jump in with each other. Maybe we can have this shepherd and this device and share a microphone as well as I uh, drop it to me and the problem. And the first question I wanted to start with was, um, was there a point in time when you recognized that the university system as a whole faced problems? Right. I, I started to see uh, a shift in, in the early 90s when I was doing my, my PhD. Uh, a lot of my uh, fellow grad students were 
have difficult times getting hired and that sort of thing. And so we, we started to see kind of the writing on the wall, as it were. Um, I didn't start to experience it until I got my PhD in 98 and began teaching at, at various universities on various levels. Um, I wrongly assumed that because I was in an academic institution that I had a certain level of freedom uh, to be who I was, uh, which was an advocate for free speech and somebody who liked to entertain uh, uh, interesting dialogue and have discussions and on, on any topics whatsoever that no subject in particular was taboo if we're discussing it on a philosophical level. I realized that this didn't work well in my favor and that others saw this for whatever their biases led them to believe. And it was unfortunate that this, this happened to me before I got tenure. And it has always been my advice to any young scholars uh, coming up um, to give them what I think the title of my autobiography will be, which is called Get the Tenure First. <laughs> I guess um, uh, I probably would have to admit that I was probably part of the problem because I think because I, I started in um, my undergraduate uh, degree in 1989, so I think it was just as the um, universities were starting to become politicized. So I was I think I was coming in just as it was starting, and so I was internalizing a lot of those beliefs. And I used to believe that it was good when those groups would come and would deplatform. I thought it was the honorable thing to do. So I was largely agreeing with the tactics and it was only in uh, 2015 that I started to have a, an awakening it was just because I was talking to a close friend of mine who played a large role in uh, making me the person who I was because he, he had a huge influence on me and I hadn't seen him for years and then when we were talking just everything turned out to be about racism and everything was somehow the uh, military industrial complex's fault including uh, in my own subdivision why people would not uh, want to have sidewalks. So he would listen to a very basic explanation, which is that the people in my subdivision didn't want their property taxes to go up. Somehow it was Stephen Harper's fault with the military industrial complexes. And so with everything I tried to do, I just could not reason with him. That's when I started to uh, have an awakening and it was that sense of, oh my God, I'm actually part of the problem. And so that's when I decided, okay, well, I thought, well, the first thing I have to do is stop being part of the problem. And so in doing so, I started to wake up, open up my eyes to actually what was happening. And so like I said in my opening remarks, that's the, the first major event that really uh, really struck a chord with me was the, uh, the Christakis' uh, story, and then uh, the event at uh, Brown University with uh, Wendy McElroy when she did her talk um, with um, uh, Jessica Valenti with, about the debate about the rape culture. And then afterwards, it turned out that Jessica Valenti's a uh, whole basis for her uh, comments was the case of Emma Sokowitz, which was which turned out to be uh, debunked. So that really started to have me just aware of what was going on in the universities. And I really thought that this was something that I could do where I could maybe save this from happening at my own institution. Uh, but the way I kind of perceive it is that everything was just quietly having, happening in the background. And then that I opened up a can of worms when I started to ask uh, questions about the issues like the gender, you know, the explanation for the gender inequality or the decolonization. So my question is, what I think what's been happening at my own institution is that anyone who did dare to speak up uh, would be silenced by uh, overuse of our harassment and discrimination policy, just that there what would happen is they'd be, they'd be silent, they'd stay in the background because they'd want to, you know, imagine keep their employment, uh, provide for their families and whatnot. Uh, whereas I was openly quiet and said, no, I'm not going to be doing this. And I guess the reason for that and why I'm still uh, staying vocal is the way I see it is that I am just uh, doing my job. So when we use that expression, I think a lot of times people just think that expression means, oh, I'm going to work, I'm going to get my paycheck, and then I can go home and do what I uh, really enjoy. But the way I see it is that as a professor, I have certain uh, moral and ethical, like, ethical obligations to the society that I serve. And so that does mean that, um, that this is something that I must do just because um, in terms of the, the what I do in my job, in terms of what I see as my responsibility, is that I'm training the next generation of students. They're going to go on to become the teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, and they're going to have then a bigger effect on the next generation. So that's what I think 
help compels me to keep doing what I am doing. For me, the embarkment into understanding the necessity for free speech was instant, and I really can't explain how instant it was of a plunge. Um, it was really just, you know, the disciplinary meeting that I was subjected to, and even back then, I didn't understand. I couldn't put into words. I didn't have the theory or the experiences to quite know what was going on. So I think in like early media interviews, I was doing, I probably seemed even a little bit confused, but like. I, every day I look into this stuff, and every day I read articles about free speech, and it's it's really consumed everything. But you know, if, if you rewind a couple months ago, before November, I was one of those people who thought that um, the only people who care about free speech are people who have really dumb ideas. I really thought that, um, and I remember actually my mom reading an article from the Vancouver Sun to me, and I was just sitting at the kitchen table, and it was actually about Jordan Peterson. Um, and it was a name I didn't know at that point. It, it was probably in, I think, yeah, late 2016. I was still an undergrad. And she told me that he was at McMaster and the students were using air horns and using like noise machines to drown out what he was trying to say. And I remember my response to her and I was like, oh, okay. And I just like, I didn't understand the implication of it. And of course now I hear stuff like that and I completely understand the implication. So it's, it, for me, it was one of those things where it really had to happen to me, uh, for me to understand, you know, everything that goes along with free speech and why we need it. So sometimes when I see people making fun of free speech, like there's this meme like freeze peach, like the fruit of the peach, and like it's frozen. Like people make fun of it. Um, they they will say social media comments like "lol" um, when I tweet about events being shut down and deplatformed. They think it's funny, um, but. I, I don't tend to attack those people because I think one day they might see. And I think one day it might happen to them, you know, because they're the saying the left eats their own and all that. Um, so I try to just, you know, see how this plays out, I suppose. Oh gosh. I have known, I knew from the beginning as a result of my experience and my way of thinking that there were limits to freedom in academia even before I entered it. And so there was never that moment of <coughs> recognition I did when, I, when this young student uh, said she felt uncomfortable in my classroom. I began to realize that this <coughs> disease that we must be fairly feel comfortable uh, in the world. The world is a shitty place. All of you are sitting there dying. Trying your best to conceal your various diseases and aches and pains. Well, that's you, but you deal with that. If you're a five year old, yes, you protect them. But when you're a 25 year old, to do that, that's, that's what I, my objection to religion is. Religion teats, uh, treats people, organized religion, that is. I'm not talking about spiritual dimension to reality, that's another story. But uh, organized religion treats people uh, like uh, children. You poor thing, you can't deal with, with death. So we'll promise you, you know, you're going to have a wonderful time if you do what I like. Well, I'm sorry. The basic thing about freedom of speech, it's essential. Science, from a Greek word, searching for knowledge, is basically entirely dependent on conflict. The first thing a scientist does when he has an, a theory that develops from the observation of nature is to try and prove that it's wrong. This juxtaposition of you know negative and positive, yin and yang, whatever you want to call it, is absolutely fundamental and essential. Without it. We just subside into, uh, well, I don't want to use obscene words, so I'll stop. <laughs> so I want to remind the panelists that you don't have to go in order. It's fine that you did this time. If you want to jump in with each other, that's totally fine. Um, the next question I want to pose to you, uh, 
we have very extensive freedom in Canada, and most people won't run afoul of Canada's hate speech laws, and yet some speech seems to harm people. Do you think that there should be boundaries to free speech or consequences when an academic proposes ideas that are unacceptable to large numbers of people? I think I know the general, <laughs> the general feeling from the panel, but uh, is, there a, is there a point or at what point do you think you said? So are there limits to free speech and expression? Yeah, in, in terms of context, yes, we do this all the time in terms of context, right? In fact, we must do this or it would lead to devastating consequences. So in terms of context, we cannot freely allow anyone to say anything they want, anytime they want. So you can't be 30,000 feet in the air and your pilot says, hey, I feel like I'm gonna crash this morning. <laughs> they can't say that. They ought not to say that. It should be a moral imperative not to say that. So within the context, right, a journalist cannot simply say whatever they want to deliberately uh, mislead. This goes for all sorts of things. You know, your your physician cannot tell you things, you know. You have four weeks to live. Nah, I'm just kidding, right? They, I, freely, I freely wanted to say that. Well, no, within that context, no. In terms of discussion, it's all on the table. We should be able to talk about it. Anything we want, philosophical. If the, if the pilot, however, sees that he is about to cry, crash the plane, I'd be object to him not telling me. He's about to my last <laughs> thought. <laughs> so yeah, in terms of uh, dialogue and discussion, we should be free to discuss any idea. Once it starts to generate obvious harm, so it, it entices people, to, to generate harm. So um, some of you will remember um, the original Woodstock in 1969. Some of you are old enough to remember that. There was another one in 1999. And it was nothing like the original one. It was not the summer of love. It was the summer of grossness. I don't know what it was, but there's a guy on stage uh, from a band called uh, Limp Biscuit. I don't know if you guys know who Fred Durst <laughs> is. And do you remember what he did? Right? He said, it's time to break stuff up. Okay, he has the freedom to say that. But when you've got an audience listening to every word, hanging on every word you say, and they proceeded to break stuff up, do we limit free speech in that, in that, you know, in that case? It's one thing to have dialogue and discuss philosophically, what would it be like if everybody broke stuff up? We talk about that as the cows come on. But to tell somebody they should, yeah, I think they're. Well, I would. I would agree that the, there are limits to free speech. You cannot invite people to be violent against other people. That is simply out of the question. The danger, of course, is that that can be interpreted by uh, sophisticated lawyers who shut you up when you're not actually advocating violence when you are simply criticizing somebody, some government, some party, some whatever, uh, that uh, could lead to violence. Well, if you operate like that, everything could lead, be, lead to violence. We might as well shut up. Yes, you guys should... should oh, no, no, sorry, I'm not the answer. <laughs> I guess I'll jump in, because I guess, um, I guess the answers that were given are all predicated on the first part being true, but uh, the way I see, uh, the way I see, it, the devil is always in the detail. So at the beginning, you talk about this uh, notion of harm, and I guess there's always the element: what do we actually mean by harm itself? Uh, so is it going to be some, some kind of physical harm, and that doesn't happen in a classroom? Psychological harm, maybe in terms of, you know, you get your feelings hurt. So I guess we're going to add, address that question of harm. We want to be able to think of, um, I guess, the nature of the harm, but. Uh, maybe something like the intensity and duration of the harm. So when you have a kind of an injury, uh, so you can think of, you know, your cat scratches you, but you're not going to put your cat down for something like that, right? You know, they like your eye, if not, it might be a bit annoying, but in that sense, it's not really, you know, it's, it's not going to cause any permanent damage. Uh, but it's more like, you know, if you're bit by a rabbit dog, that's going to be much, much different. So my kind of conceptualize it for the classroom is that in terms of what we're trying to do, is that you can think of the classroom as being like the martial arts studio where we're trying to train students to be able to deal with what's going to happen in the real world where we're not always going to have the rules there to protect them. 
But if they can at least be uh, ready for any kind of argument when they get out into the real world, we could at least prepare them for most of what's going to happen in their in, in their outdoor situation. So the way I kind of conceptualize it is, yeah, within the confines of the classroom, it's going to be like a martial arts studio. Uh, but we do have rules in place, so you know, in terms of where you can and can't hit. So the maybe at most you'll get is maybe a few bruises, but bruises heal. So it's not like there's going to be any long-term harm. So it's just some short-term harm that heals quickly, and that's maybe what we're trying to aim for in, in the worst-case scenario in a university setting. Yeah. Um, so just to expand on what you're saying, like can you give an example? Um, so the speaker I want to bring in next week, Frances Widowson, her central argument from what I understand right now is that um, Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations um, will not thrive the way the current system is. And she's written a book called, uh, I think it's Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry. And of course, these are uh, topics that are really taboo in, in today's society. Um, and so I had a Indigenous student, I think at the University of Waterloo, um, send a social media comment my way. And she said that um, by virtue of me inviting Francis Winosin, um, did you know that communities, I'm, I'm damaging entire communities by bringing in speakers like this. Um, and every time I bring in a speaker like Francis Widowson, um, it takes months, weeks and months for her community to heal. And so like when I first, and there was other stuff too about like generational, um, generational healing and, and how uh, this shit hurts us. Um, I want Lindsay Shepard to read this. Um, and my first instinct when I read something like this is I, I kind of do feel like that twinge of like feeling bad and like feeling sorry for this person. Um, but then I read it again and it's just, it's like you're not forced to go to this this talk. And someone wrote on my Twitter once um, in regards to another event we held, you know, these students just need to take a nap and when they wake up it'll be over and it will have never affected them. They're not forced to go. Um, you know, one, the Indigenous Student Union at University of Waterloo also wrote this statement where they said like, we we do not want to be forced to hear these opinions. Well, you're not. Like, we, we charged a ticket fee for you to come in. So if you're not going to pay the fee to come in, then you do not have to hear it, uh, ever, really. Um, and so, you know, is this, you know, I had to think. And I, I responded publicly. I said, how is an event that you're not forced to go to um, making you need to heal for months? I, I don't get it. And I am interested in a genuine answer from her, and I hope she will respond. And, you know, how does this person who has professional and academic expertise in this area damage entire communities? Because whether she gives a talk, a, a talk at Wilfrid Laurier University or not, she's still going to go home and have those opinions. And she's still writing books, you know. Is that actively damaging your community? Like, how far do we go with this? So. Even if you are not prepared to subject your own opinions and views to scrutiny, to criticism, then you obviously don't think they're worth much. You don't feel that they can be defended. But if you advance them, then you must accept opposition. When you say literature, as I have, uh, almost anything can become the subject of a discussion in the class because the entire world and human experience is the province of writers. And I remember an occasion when Catholicism came up and the student uh, tried to, you know, not in, exactly indoctrinate me, but to state, you know, the truth, it's in the Bible, and so forth. And, uh, you know, I went to Holy Communion on Sunday. I said, okay, that's an interesting issue. Now, do you believe that the host that you take is actually a physical part of the God? Well, that's the teaching of the church, he says. I said, well, then you have to be able to tell me which part of Jesus you, Jesus you ate this morning. <laughs> so I, I, I know that the, 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 the lines are fluid. There are people who have finer sensibility and say, oh, you don't call that. It's offensive to this person. I don't know. My, I, I was very pleased. I have three daughters. And my middle one went to a camp. I didn't know that at this camp they also had a, a mass. And she went, she went to communion too. We had no idea what that was about. Uh, she was still young. And, and the priest gave her this host. She thought it was breakfast and said, can I have another one? 
I thought my educational methods had succeeded. <laughs> And, you know, we have to beg the question, why does a university need a statement that's different from the societal rights at large? Is it really that different? You know, and the only thing that makes it different is the current victimhood mentality of the students and, and their need to be coddled. And um, there was recently a, a town hall um, at Laurier because, you know, they, they wrote the statement, you can see it online, they, they released it last week or so. And, um, you know, they do try to place it to both sides. So, like, it's usually perceived as this thing of free speech and open inquiry versus diversity and inclusion, which is false. It's, it's not, they're not opposed to each other. Um, but, you know, the kind of typical um, LGBTQ activists who, you know, really came after me in the fall, um, they were at the town hall, and, and one of them, you know, the, the statement, in my opinion, it, it does nothing to offend. Um, you know, marginalized communities. It mentions them many times. It introduces this concept of um, inclusive freedom, I believe, which is, you know, does it really mean anything? No, but it uses the word freedom and inclusivity. Um, <laughs> and this person um, almost cried as they were at a microphone speaking to the task force that drafted the statement. Uh, they were talking about how they are a broken body and like this statement is so bad for their community. At the end, uh, this person hugged someone, and then they posed a question to the task force, but then stormed out of the room. So we had to listen to this person talk for, I don't know, seven minutes, and then they just left. Um, so we had to listen to them, but apparently um, <clears throat> they don't have to listen to the response that was given to them. And, you know, it just kind of went like this, very melodramatic and very much about not supporting marginalized communities, and it absolutely did. It really did, and you can read the statement for yourself, and they're taking in consultations from the diversity and equity office and you know anyone's allowed to respond to this and unfortunately because the only people who came up to that microphone were you know uh, discontented with the statement it was the people who advocate for marginalized communities and such and there's now this impression that this statement is unfair to them and I mean again there was people at that microphone saying uh, everyone on this task force is a white supremacist and I can tell you, the people on the task force, they were, you could tell they were alienated by that. The ones who were pro-inclusivity. You know, there was one guy who I know is, is Persian, and he said, how dare you call me a white supremacist? But still, the accusations keep coming. You know, your, your statement defends white supremacy. It, it always comes back to these things, and then you ask them to expand on what they mean, and they just can't substantiate what they mean. So we're just kind of left in this perpetual confusion and, and misunderstanding of the meanings. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I'll uh, jump in because, um, yeah, because I, yeah, because uh, I, 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 like I'm in the classes, I kind of joked about the idea of that I'm also um, considered an alt right and a, you know, a, a white supremacist as well, and so I just kind of joked about how they are, they've also joined on the inclusivity bandwagon that, and now I get to have a membership that I didn't get to have in the past, and try to sort of make light of just how absurd the argument actually is. Uh, but one of the measures that I was hoping that um, I would actually get students to get on board with, which unfortunately was unsuccessful, was just the idea if we can actually have a surgeonist training, because the way I see it is uh, the whole idea of trying to take people from the top and bring them down doesn't really, is kind of productive, so how can we build people up? And so and that makes at least for a level playing field, so if let's say someone is shy, doesn't want to speak up in class, that's where something like a surgeon's training might help, or if um, you know if someone's really being belligerent, how do you actually deal with that situation? So that way, it then teaches them a skill they can use uh, in real life. And so that was something I proposed as an idea to try to help deal with the problem. And I guess with the issue related to the sexual assault on campus, I know from what I've read, uh, the biggest problem that's contributing to that is the um, alcohol usage and just the drinking culture that we have now that seems so much more pronounced and much worse than it was in the past. And so I think uh, some of that problem actually, which I cited Laura Pippins' work from her book, um, Sexual Paranoid Comes to Campus, 
uh, which I think is that when people are getting all these mixed messages, especially when they're young, trying to figure out who they actually are, and everything just seems to be mixed and they don't really know how to cope, we don't have the communication skills to talk with one another, uh, then what is there to do to cope but to drink? And um, yeah, and I think then the drinking was what contributes to some of those problems that we see with the sexual assault. So the idea that I had was try to deal with those two issues, and I think that would deal with a lot of the underlying problems. And so it's the idea of just trying to get the, uh, the support to actually get that underway. Um, <clears throat> by issuing statements for freedom of speech and changing policy and that sort of thing, uh, most universities are basically just paying lip service to some bullshit attitude they think will keep their clients in in, in company and satisfying them with the type of power they want to sell. It's going to take a long time for universities to turn this ship around and get back to doing what a university is supposed to do, which is to challenge your ideals, challenge your assumptions, make you become critical thinkers. There are some departments in philosophy I'm associated with, they don't even teach critical thinking. They don't even teach it. It should be mandatory at every university. And every student should have to take critical thinking. And I'm trying to get it started in the high school so they're already ready for this, that they already have the capacity to think critically for themselves. Right? Not what to think, how to think. And we assume students know how to do this. They don't. They don't. We assume they do, and they don't. There are rules for learning. There are rules for thinking, and there are rules to having dialogue, and to do this in a respectful way where we can learn what C.S. Lewis called the art of disagreement. And when we stop doing this, we fail our students, and we perpetuate the bloody business model of a university who says it's all about the students, which is absolute bullshit. I feel like I should puke every time I hear this. They care about the bottom line, which is money. If they want to hire somebody and that person gets a lot of grant money, that's the person who gets hired. It doesn't matter how good of a teacher they are. It's just how much more money can you make this university and how good can we feel about ourselves and our particular image. Thank you for the rant. My answer to the question is no. <laughs> First of all, thank you all very much for coming and saying what you said. It was refreshing to hear. My question is, would any of you like to speak on the question of selective enforcement of the snowball of growing rules, regulations, and laws that limit speech? And also in the context, selective enforcement also in terms of an overarching agenda that's applied both after the fact and in the formation of these rules, regulations, and laws, and thank you. I can speak briefly about selective enforcement. Here's an example. Um, do you folks know who Henry Morgenthaler was? Yeah. Okay. So Henry singularly, single-handedly, changed the laws in Canada to allow women to have safe abortions. Now, whether you're for abortion or against abortion, I think we can all agree that if, if a woman makes that decision, she should have a safe place to go in which to have it done. Henry did that. 1988, he did that. When he died, I was asked to give a eulogy at his funeral. After his funeral, I spoke with his widow, Arlene, we had talked a bit, and I was having uh, lunch with a dean at the University of Toronto from the Faculty of Medicine. And I just said, just putting it out there, I said, what would happen if, uh, if Henry's widow uh, took some of his estate and donated to the University of Toronto $5 million uh, for the Henry Morgan Taller Chair in Bioethics, and we would like Professor DiCarlo to, to have that position? What would happen? And he said, and I cannot believe this, 
half would be for it and half would be against it. We can't risk it because he was such a controversial figure that they wouldn't even accept the money and his name attached because the other donors have affiliations that disagreed with Henry Morgenthal and that would hurt their overall mm -hmm. receiving of funding. So that's how deep it goes that a person who did this great service for women is still, you know, ma made, yeah, made a villain and, and, and it's so hypocritical. It's mm -hmm. unbelievably hypocritical and yet there it is. And I just want to keep turning over rocks into the, you know, the light of day so we can see what's crawling around underneath them. Because this is what's happening right now. So. Anybody else want to answer? Or can we move to the next question? Yeah, can't really much. yeah, well, this kind of goes back to having the institutional statements on freedom of expression, too, is we have to think about how much, how much power those are going to have. So, for example, um, one of the things I was accused of when I brought up gender neutral pronouns in my classroom, um, I violated the gendered and sexual violence policy. And I was also accused of violating Bill C-16, which again is um, related to compelled speech in some people's opinion, and uh, the Canadian or Ontario Human Rights Code. So those were kind of debunked, but it was true that I violated the gendered and sexual violence policy by merely presenting an argument that, um, you know, or presenting the view that some people don't want to use gender neutral pronouns for whatever reason. Uh, so if there was an institutional statement of freedom of expression that said, you know, we have to have free speech, um, wouldn't I still be subject to the gender and sexual violence policy? So it, it kind of matters on the hierarchy of the policies. And, um, it, you know, in my opinion, I, I probably would have still been subjected to it because I think that would come before some sort of, you know, I think you used the term like lip service statement of expression, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can kind of build on that, Lindsay's point, because um, I guess what we have both have in common is, yeah, violating the policy. And what I've noticed about, about mine is, or I guess what I have in common is, this is what a reasonable person would think. And so it depends on how what you define by reasonable person. So within the context of the universities where there's just an ideological shift to the left, and it's so, um, and there's, and I guess it's so concentrated with very little variability. Uh, the definition of what's a reasonable person within the university context is very different from that of mainstream society. And so I guess that's sort of the other issue here is that yeah, with those uh, statements and whatnot, is uh, you know, are they really somehow, especially when they're trying to remake society in their own image? Uh, that I guess those are some of the questions, and then that determines who's going to be at what quest, or what university, and what image they're going to try to make. And I think, I guess, getting at that question is that you know, depending on the context, you're going to have these different institutions with different forms of social engineering, and neither neither of which is desired. <laughs> sort of just by uh, addressing Henry's point about the importance of language, I recently discovered um, a very uh, useful and life-changing word. It's eustress. It's the opposite of distress. And what it is, is it's stress that builds out of build and builds us up. It's stress that builds our body. It's good stress. It's stress that builds our character and builds our mind. So eustress is, is a word that I think we can, we can use in describing building these uncomfortable spaces. Um, my you, how, how do you spell that? It's, it's U, e, it's the Greek, right? So E U, stress, U stress. Um, uh, my, my question is, uh, and it, it ties us to uh, humanism and, and atheism. So uh, it, it, it seems that we have, like, we, not only in universities, where I think, like, a lot of the <coughs> universities would describe themselves as secular and Certainly, many of the staff, if you um, talk to them as individuals, they, they, they consider themselves atheists or maybe agnostics. And we have the same issue within the community. There was this, there was this, this great schism around uh, 2011, 2012. Um, so my question is, is where, what is the role, or what is, is it in, there something intrinsic to free speech, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, in humanism or atheism, and how do we define that? So it's more like a philosophically minded question there. And do you mean that should uh, religious discussions be excluded from universities? Is that what the object of your question? My question is, is, is it 
a necess is freedom of speech a necessary component of atheism or humanism in your definition or or how would you divide that? Are there denominations of humanism in that regard? Freedom of, freedom of expression seems to me to be independent uh, from of religion. I can imagine some religious people who would not want to put religious teaching on the table for discussion. That is the weakness of religion, of course. And that, that I can see. But uh, I know people who have that what they now call, quote, spiritual, unquote, sentiments about the universe. And uh, they're all for freedom of speech because they don't know. They're searching to try and make sense of this mysterious universe that uh, we forget how mysterious it is and uh, that we don't really know what it's all about. So I don't really, I don't know, maybe you have a strong feeling yeah. about it? Yeah. Yeah, so very quickly, uh, here, here's, how, here's how it goes down. I'm a professor of accounting. I teach accounting. I'm a full professor. Because I'm a professor of philosophy who teaches students how to think, critical thinking, and ethics, and I happen to be a well-known atheist, that, that has hurt my career severely. I've had other colleagues say, well, you know, I'm an atheist. Yeah, but you're not an outed atheist. You're not an advocate for free speech and allowing people to have dialogue, intelligent dialogue with you about the existence of God and whatnot. You're, you're not known for it. You're a closet atheist at best. So that's why you have tenure, and that's why I don't. So, you know, that's basically how it's been for me. Yeah, I guess my views on religion have uh, changed, especially if, um, this uh, past year, because I had to talk the, the second half of the introductory psychology course, but what I've come to think, having taught the whole, both has in the, in the same year, is that there's the science side which, uh, uh, you know, deals with the objective questions, but in terms of what determines what might be the questions of interest, uh, can be sometimes influenced by the values, and what plays a role in our values uh, does often come from the world's religions, and when you just see some of the same kind of symbols coming across different cultures, even though they've never met because they were physically apart. So I think there is something to the uh, elements of the religion and spiritualities that speak to our values in terms of, especially in the age now of you know cloning and drones and lack of privacy and all that. So uh, sort of in terms of how do we deal with some of those uh, questions, I think the religion does have some components. And I, from the psychological perspective, I think um, some of those spiritual beliefs form a core part of our identity and help us to at least find ways of conceptualizing the world. So even though I'm not religious myself, I've started to find that I'm open to some of the ideas just because they, they help me sort of conceptualize a world that right now does not often make sense. Thank you. Hello. I'm just doing a full bullet point first. My mom, um, she's taught herself a lot of metal work, jewelry on YouTube. I myself have learned quite a bit from the internet, and Jordan Peterson has spoken of an online university. Could the future of higher education be in undermining the current institutions and decentralizing the higher learning through the medium of the internet? Is that the fire alarm? Well, I guess, I guess with everything, it has its uh, pros and cons. So I think when it comes to the <coughs> online learning, that can be uh, good for people who might not be able to access the classroom. Uh, so it does have its place. Uh, but I guess the way I try to do is that when I have the classroom, try to make it so that it's word students while to come there, so that what you get from a classroom experience that you just couldn't get from watching some online videos, uh, which has to do with the human interaction in the classroom. Uh, and so that's what I think makes the classroom unique. And I don't think that could ever uh, die out is the way I kind of see it. So I think there is a role for both. Um, yeah, if the current university system did fall and, you know, Jordan, and I was able to get, you know, hired at Jordan Peterson's online university, if that were to ever form, I, I would definitely give that serious consideration. I think the danger with that is that it would become, would fall into the hands of the wrong people and you will get one point of view only. I, my experience of the net, useful as it is in some ways, is that it has seriously depressed 
the level of intelligence and discourse. <laughs> and it is designed that when, when, when uh, Chris was saying earlier how they don't teach critical thinking, that's essential. Of course they don't teach critical thinking. Our educational system is designed for all of you and all of us to be consumers. And to be a consumer, you have to be uncritical. You have to be practically an imbecile. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. There's massive online courses. They can express their opinion. Different universities have them. But it'll never replace, I think, that face-to-face -face, uh, experience. Yeah, ultimate, ultimately, I think that um, every individual is different. And his or her learning processes are different. In an ideal world, every individual would have his or her own teacher or teachers to, uh, to deal with your particular way of unfolding in this world, and it's always different from somebody else. And anything that goes away from that, for me, is questionable. <laughs> Obviously, I realize that uh, it's un uh, impractical, shall we say, for all of us to have our personal teachers. I, I don't like the idea of online universities. I think, similar to what you said, I think you just can't really replace um, being in a room together and learning in that way. The problem is, though, I know like for me, when I started my graduate degree was just uh, being disappointed at, at the level the conversations were at, um, never going past identity politics and stuff like that. So it's, it's really about the quality of the people who are in your room, too. Um, but, you know, for example, um, when Laurie Society for Opening Creed wanted to bring in, you know, let's say Faith Goldie, a lot of people were saying she doesn't need to come to campus, she already has videos online. If anyone wants to listen to her, they can just go online. Well, that to me seems pretty dangerous because that's when you just get people locked in the room watching hours of the same person. That person is not being challenged in those, in those YouTube videos where they're just filming themselves talking or talking to like-minded people. So, you know, it's better to have someone physically there uh, with this setup, you can question them. You can actually engage them and look them in the eye and ask them questions. You can kind of feel the room. That to me is really important. I don't like this idea of being atomized and being alone just with our laptops and watching people on YouTube. So thanks again for coming. I know some of you guys are traveling and all that. And thanks for the humanists for putting this on. I mean, we, here we are in the room having that interaction. Yeah, right? yeah. That's why we came. <laughs> so uh, uh, thing number two, um, I am a high school teacher in uh, English and uh, social studies. And uh, so I'm trying my level best, guys. <laughs> I really, really am. Uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Uh, so my question is, um, I'm glad you brought up uh, Brett Weinstein and the, uh, the Evergreen uh, issue. Uh, uh, heard, saw him interviewed on the Rubin Report. Um, uh, and he used, it, this has been th almost like an earworm, he, he used a word to describe these protests, the deplatforming protests and whatnot. Uh, we've probably seen the videos and whatnot. Um, but they're not genuine protests with, with the agenda that maybe they're, they're presenting. He called it an insurgency. Now that sounds, right? That sounds hyperbolic, but then my question is, so what do you think? genuine agenda for social Im improvement or is is it an insurgency is it some sort of a, a, a strategic move for some darker agenda i don't want to get all conspiracy theory or anything but i don't know what do you what do you, what do you think is the agenda behind the so-called social justice warriors the world in absolute terms so if there's any kind of exception then that by itself is a reason to take down the structure so a 99.9% .9 probably is not good enough Sorry, that thank you. exactly 100% when they see the world and so they don't see the world in any kind of uh, gradation or anything along probabilistic lines it's really really just yeah this really dichotom dichotomized view um, that's why I think the end goal just seems to be is just yeah deconstruction for the sake of burn it down Yes, yeah. sir. Let's turn right to the foundation. Mm -hmm.